I am back in the saddle and with actually a really cool piece of content for you today because I've got the 5800X 3D, the 5700X and the 5600 and I'm going to be doing like a three in one review. Good afternoon morning and welcome to Turbo Tour Tech. If you're new here, I'm Reese of the Four Piece Variety or Walking Triple XL. And as I've indicated, I've got the new 5000 series stock from Ryzen. I did get it quite a while ago. I'm really sorry for this being so late. My NVMe failed in the most random of ways. It would reinstall Windows and work perfectly until you did the update and then it would fail, which was really random. And eventually it then failed outright. And then obviously I knew I need a new NVMe. And then when I got a new NVMe, I got COVID and bronchitis at the same time. So now that I'm done coughing and spluttering and I can actually stand and present the results and findings from this, we are now here. So let's just jump straight into it then, shall we? So the test bench setup, we have been donated a new cooler by Deepcool, which has been absolutely fantastic and actually shows how you kind of, well, you are gonna need water cooling to get the most out of your 5800X 3D, especially when you are going to be rendering or doing stuff like that. This is an absolutely perfect cooler though for this build because I generally test more of the eight core or less AMDs on this, but now with the new 5800X 3D, it's proving to be a little bit of a hot boy if you wanna get the most out of it, especially where multi-threaded is concerned. But for things like the 5700X and the 5600, the 5600 being in the system right now, it runs absolutely like silently at 50 degrees. So it's an absolutely perfect cooler for this environment. Thank you so much, Deep Cool, for that. MB300 old case, if you're wondering, I, do, I have put it in an aftermarket fan kit. Another fan kit, uh, one of the Sickle Flow fan kits from Cooler Master was donated, and then there is a fan extracting at the top. So it is pretty decent airflow. You might notice, though, there are 3070 Ti barely scraped in. They talk about my fitment, but that was like millimeter scraping on the on the front there, but I did it did fit. So um, I did check as well the case's dimension versus this, and it said it won't fit because normally the fans are actually on the inside, but I put them on the outside to just get a little bit extra space so that I could then fit the GPU. So you can make a plan. 3070 Ti Supreme X is a monster though, and the highest I got it to under constant load was about 64 degrees and the fans didn't even really spin. So there was no airflow issues. I did leave it open like this because, well, yeah, it would have uh, maybe broken some cables and stuff because our 850 watt Antec does tend to have quite, uh, you know, rigid heat shrink over here. It doesn't bend very well. It's my one criticism of the power supply. But it's 850 gold, so more than enough power provision. The board, you might think as well, maybe not enough, but for the TDPs and stuff of these chips, it's got more than enough headroom. And even the 5800X3D was giving us full boost the whole time and hitting its maximum wattage or its general maximum wattage that I've seen from other reviews as well that have come out. So everything was performing at its highest level. And to bolster that, because 3600 CL18 is now like 1,300 Rand for a two by eight gig kit at EVTEC, I noticed that we got some 4,000 megahertz CL19s at a very good price. It was about 1,700 Rand right now. So it's like for a build of this sort of spec, why not just get the better RAM for 500 bucks? It just makes sense to just squeeze every inch of performance out of it. So I got one of those kits in as well to complete the system build. Now with the benchmarking, I do like benchmarks that have a set routine run. About the only one that I don't have a set routine run for is actually Need for Speed Heat, where I just do the one track and I try to capture it as accurately as possible. It is difficult if it's if it isn't like a set thing. Like Vermintide 2 is a really good benchmark because it's always the same benchmark. Similarly now with Cyberpunk, they've added that in Metro, CS. Uh, there's a run from Uletical, which is amazing. If you guys don't know about it, you must definitely get it. Especially the heavy smoke stacks will show you if you do have CPU bottlenecks, that'll be your minimum FPS that you see on the bar graphs in a little while. But those, are, those tests are very routine and they've very structured so that it's difficult for it to create anomalous data just based on the environment. That's why I don't, I'm actually moving away from things like Doom for instance, where I have to play the same level and then just hope I have the exact same experience. I think you see the sort of inherent issue with that. With Dota even for instance, I can, I've got the same replay, I've been using the same replay actually since I started the channel and so it's always been the exact same test set up while the game may have changed it's tested at the same time on the exact same medium of testing so those are reliable benchmarks 
And I've got some pretty cool fire strike data, which I can show you with the 12600K, which I did capture before that NVMe fail. So, without further ado, without further gilding of the lily, let's jump straight into it. If you're looking at CPU-based games like CSGO, for instance, there is a noticeable performance improvement from the 5800X3D. This carries over into Dota 2 as well, where there's like a 30 frame 30 fps frame increase and that's the difference between like a high 190 and a low 230 so getting closer to that 240 hertz esport premium setup for that and the, i think it would do that even with a lower end gpu if i'm actually honest because of how fast the caching system is on the 5800 x3d looking further into games like vermintide 2 we see that gap get absolutely massive need for speed as well was a 30 fps difference and that was on the exact same track with the exact same car in the exact same race under the exact same conditions, as close as I could get them at least. If you're looking at productivity as well, you'll notice that there, is, there are massive gains in Cinebench. The 5800X 3D and the 5700X are both eight core CPUs with basically the same cores. It's literally just the caching system that's been improved that's giving you that performance leap. Same thing is happening over in Blender. While the 5700X is clearly ahead of the 5600, or the 5800X3D is just stomping on them. Now, the only thing with that though, in those productivity workloads, is it was hitting 84 degrees. And that's not a thermal throttling point, which I've already identified to be at 90 degrees, where I used it for another cooler test. Actually, when I did the AK400, I had it in here already and did the AK400 test on this with the stock AMD cooler. And what I saw with the stock AMD cooler was it will thermal throttle and then you will lose performance just inherently with that. This is borderline for the 5800X3D, this tire cooler. You are going to want to get a 240mm radiator and strap it to this puppy. Then it's going to be giving you the boost all day because this is a 100, 150 watt sort of cooler. That will be a 200 watt cooler. And so it'll keep this chip underneath that 90 degree threshold where it does start to thermal throttle. There's also a lot of myth going around that that's really bad for your CPU. It's designed to be at those temperatures these days. The transistor quality doesn't decay nearly as much as it used to. I know I had a 2600K at 4.8 gigahertz for like basically four and a half years. And the transistor decay happened even though I kept it most of the time in the low, in the low 60s, high 50s. Even under max load, had a cast of Venom Black, absolutely massive cooler, tile cool on it with dual 120s on it still would hit only about 67 under full all core load and it's still transistor decay even though it was at a good temperature what sorry about my rude phone i forgot to put it on silent but back to the show so now these three chips are kind of interesting the 5600 is coming at a much more aggressive price point the difference between that and the x is going to be quite diminishing returns unless you water cool and do some overclocking and some optimizations yourself with ryzen master out of box, it's going to be a very similar experience. The 5700X is added now at sort of a weird time. The 5800X3D is going to completely eliminate the 5800X itself. So these are both eight cores, but they're kind of in different veins. The 5700X strikes me as a really good bang for buck entry level development option. If you're doing programming, assembly, stuff in Adobe Suite, 3ds Max, even those sort of suites, this 8 core is going to do quite well in those environments and be able to render for you at its price point. It's going to be super, super solid. The 5800X3D is really the highlight from this release series, and that's because of how they've done the caching system. In layman's terms, they've allowed the cache to interact with the CPU in a lot more dynamic way. And the result of that is when it gets under an extreme load environment, like for example, Firestrike, which is what I'm gonna put onto the screen now. You see Firestrike there, the combined score has always been a weak point of the AMDs, especially in the older series. When I launched the channel with a 2700X, it used to bomb from like a 70 on the physics score to a 30 on the combined score. But now with this new caching system, it's so much better than even the competition. You'll see with the 12600K on screen, that did about 50 odd FPS on the combined score, which is quite respectable with the 3070 Ti. But this went almost to 90 FPS. That is absolutely insane. I'm, I'm just, I can't remember the exact scores that'll be on the screen for you, but you'll see there's a huge performance improvement from that. 
And that just tells me how well that caching system is actually working because it's being loaded with physics calculations in the background as well as graphical in the foreground and it's able to handle both of those workloads simultaneously with minimal performance losses. It's actually incredible how much difference it's made on in sort of one generation. Now, 5800X3D is the only 3D caching chip right now, and it is clearly the best gaming performance chip, even though it's not in the five gigahertz range like some of the 12th gen stuff, because of their caching system, it's kind of irrelevant. That's how much faster it is. And what the cache does is it stores the next set of instructions for the CPU, the things that it's gonna need most immediately for graphics and for physics. It stores that in, the, in, the, in that caching system and then feeds it up to the CPU much faster than any other memory in your system. And so because they've reworked that, the gigahertz sort of don't matter because it gets more instructions per clock because of how fast that caching system works. So gigahertz on everything. That's one thing we've got to realize here. And honestly, this is the hottest eight core that AMD's ever released. I thought the AK400, like I said, was going to be more than enough, but it turned out to be mm, just a little bit of a hot boy. The other two chips that they've released are pretty good. I am going to be doing the 4100, the 4500, and the 5500 in a review with an RX 6600 because that's a little bit more uh, reasonable. We'll keep the motherboard and RAM and NVMe the same and the power supply so we can get a good idea from that. Well, there's good supporting components to that. But for this review and for, for my findings on this, honestly, this thing is an absolute monster. It's a very, very clever move from AMD. Um, they probably were reserving this for 7000 series. It's going to be very interesting to see which chips have 3D cache system and which don't. And honestly, if there's a 12 core with the 3D caching system on, you can see from the Cinebench results how much improvement it gave even in multi-threaded over the 5700X. So now, that, like, what are they going to do with the next AM platform? Because the chipset's also changing to an LGA, or socket size is changing its socket size and stuff. So it's going to be all new motherboards, all new processors, and that's just on the horizon. But until next time, I hope you guys have enjoyed this review. If you have, please do hit us up with a like and subscribe, and I will see you on the flip side. Brrrr. <sighs>